Hello everybody, today we're going to be talking about frontal lobes, attention, and developmental disorders. So we'll start with the frontal lobes, which are some of the most complex and least understood areas of the brain. It's the largest lobe of the human brain, um, taking up about one-third of cortical volume. It's the latest to develop and to myelinate, so um, your frontal lobes are developing into your early 20s, actually. Um, and they are really important, the frontal lobes, for mediating behavior that is distinctly human. Things like being appropriate, um, things like being flexible in your thinking, abstract thinking, um, things that really make us human. And there are many parts of the frontal lobe. Um, and we'll talk about a few of them today. Uh, we've talked about some in other lectures. So the dorsolateral prefrontal lobe we'll talk about, um, the orbitofrontal, there's a medial prefrontal lobe, Broca's area we talked about, we discussed language. Um, we're gonna briefly talk about the frontal eye fields and the premotor and motor cortex um, we talked about when we were discussing movement. So let's talk about dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and what happens when you have damage to that area. Um, damage to the dorsolateral prefrontal area leads to a number of cognitive dysfunctions in what we call an area of executive functions. Um, executive functions are a group of um, cognitive abilities that are things like um, initiation, so starting a task, planning, problem solving, um, being flexible in your thinking, being able to regulate your behavior, um, being able to utilize feedback and change your behavior based on feedback, um, and metacognition. And we'll talk in more detail about these ideas. Um, but executive functions, which we think are um, housed in the frontal lobe, particularly um, some in the dorsolateral prefrontal area, um, draws on your more basic cognitive skills, like you need to have attention and language skills and perception skills, and kind of goes beyond that. Um, as I say, the executive functions are subserved by the prefrontal cortex, and that area has a lot of connections um, with other areas of the cortex, as well as subcortical, so white matter areas throughout the brain. So it's a very interconnected um, area of the brain, which perhaps allows for these very complex um, functions. Um, executive functioning plays a role in all sorts of things we do as human beings. So again, if you're able to plan and problem solve and take feedback and change your behavior, that has a big role in your academic achievement, um, your functional independence, and generally your adaptive behavior is how you can kind of adapt to the situation you're in. And we see executive functioning impairments in many different genetic, neurologic, and metabolic disorders, as well as um, when someone has particular damage to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, be it from an injury or a tumor or something like that. So in terms of the syndrome that um, comes about with dorsolateral prefrontal damage, uh, people have difficulty in a number of areas. Here are some of the um, some examples. So recall a verbal information. Um, if you give individuals a word list and ask them to memorize it, and maybe there are words in different categories like fruits and animals um, and furniture. And you don't tell them that the words are in that those categories, but you say, you know, re remember some words, um, cat, apple, bed, dog, um, desk, etc. Um, and then have them try to remember the words for you. 
um, when people don't have uh, dorsolateral prefrontal damage, they're more likely to recall the words or tell you the words back in those categories. Their brain is kind of planning and saying, oh, here's another animal. Let me remember the animals. And here's another piece of furniture. Let me remember the furniture. Um, with When pa patients have damage to this area, they just kind of remember the words in a very haphazard way. They don't use any strategy. Um, planning, one test we give as neuropsychologists for planning is a maze, just a regular paper and pencil maze um, that starts simply and get more complex. And um, as you know with mazes, right, you use your pencil and your planning, you're trying to see where should I go and you're looking ahead and if that particular, um, I don't know, road that you're trying to go down is blocked, you would say, oh, that's not a good idea. I'm going to go a different direction. And you're sort of planning before you move your pencil around the maze. Um, patients with dorsolateral prefrontal syndrome basically take their pencil and they go down every possible path. Then they turn around. They, oh, that one is blocked. I turn around. And the next one is blocked and turn around. And so you'll see their, their maze. There's no planning. It's just like, I'm going to try everything until I figure it out. Um, we say they have problems with working memory. Working memory is the ability to hold information in your memory and work with it. Um, one of the examples of a test we do for working memory is what we, as neuropsychologists, is what we call digits backwards, where you give someone a list of numbers and then ask them to repeat them to you backwards. So if I were to say, remember these words and or numbers and tell them to me backwards. Nine, four, three, six, two. Then the person has to keep that in their memory and say them to me backwards. Um, that's a hard task for anyone, but patients um, with dorsolateral prefrontal damage have trouble with this and really can't do it. Abstraction is another area where they have um, difficulties. Um, being able to not be literal and be able to kind of abstract. And there are a number of um, examples of this, but in everyday life, particularly in speech, people use um, words that are or phrases that are abstract and not literal. And we test this again as neuropsychologists by asking individuals to interpret proverbs like the proverb, don't cry over spilled milk. Um, so the abstract meaning of that, right, would be don't be upset about something that's already happened, you can't change it, something like that. Um, and then the very concrete or literal um, description would be don't be sad because you spilled your milk. So patients with dorsolateral prefrontal syndrome have trouble getting to the abstract meaning they're on the very concrete level. Flexibility of thinking and perseveration, another thing uh, you see with prefrontal, dorsolateral prefrontal damage. Um, we test this very often with something called the Wisconsin card sorting test. Um, you might be able to find this app even on your phone of some version of it to try. Um, but it is a test where um, you need to um, figure out a rule you aren't given the rule. There are cards with that have different colors and different shapes and different number of objects, and you're supposed to be matching, and you're not given the rule of how you're supposed to be matching by color or by shape or by number, and you're just getting feedback from whoever is giving you the test. Um, they're saying correct or incorrect. And so by trial and error and by using feedback, people are able to change their behavior and change their strategy to get it correct. Of course, you don't get it correct right away because you're not given the information, but it's through this feedback of correct, incorrect, that people can kind of be flexible in their thinking, um, use feedback, and get to the correct answer. And then at some point through that test, um, the rule changes. And again, the, part, the patient doesn't know, but all of a sudden they've been getting them correct, correct. Maybe they're matching the cards to shape and they keep matching and it's correct, correct, correct. And then the, chest, the test changes. And so um, then they start to get incorrect, incorrect. And they've got to be flexible. They have to change their 
strategy. And that's the idea of perseveration. Perseveration is people keep doing the same thing over and over again, regardless of feedback. They perseverate on that answer and they can't switch gears. They're very much kind of going on one track and can't switch. Um, another issue um, would be inhibition. Um, we think the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is important for inhibition. So inhibiting uh, predisposed response. Um, we use the Stroop test. You might have learned that in your um, an introduction to psych class. It's another one you could look up. The Stroop test is where you're presented with words that are the names of colors like blue, red, green, and they're presented in a different color font. And the person's job is to actually tell you the color of the font and not read the word. Well, that's pretty hard for patients with an inhibition problem because what we typically do is read words. We typically go through our day reading lots of words and we pretty much never read the color of the font like this is white. I wouldn't go around saying white, white, white because it's all white font. I would be reading the words. And so this is a task of inhibition, the Stroop task, in that you are to say the color of the font and not read the words. And it's very hard to inhibit your brain from actually reading the word. Um, and so that's a a test of inhibition and again an issue we see in um, dorsolateral prefrontal damage. Now all of those symptoms also sound like a developmental disorder called attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD and this is a disorder that we um, have known about or have started to know about for many years um, starting um, with George Still, who initially characterized attention deficit hyperactivity disorder as boys who have a defect in moral control, um, and that the early conceptualization was they have hyperkinesis or too much movement. Um, and you can see this was in 1902. Um, uh, the Lancet, which is a journal still to this day, a very prestigious journal. And here was a lecture talking about um, the study of the normal child and, and moral control and a deficit in moral control. Well, um, we have studied attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and have an changed our conceptualization of it um, and currently um, when we are looking at ADHD um, and we're diagnosing it using the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, this is how we diagnose um, different disorders and if you take an abnormal psychology class you'll learn all about it. Um, but we're basically looking at um, children and again they can be females or males, um, that have symptoms of inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. And the research suggests that ADHD consists of two factors, inattention and hyperactive impulsive. And then children present in one of three ways, either with predominantly inattentive symptoms, predominantly hyperactive impulsive symptoms, or a combined type where they have both types of symptoms. And so what are the, these symptoms? Inattention, children who are inattentive um, have a hard time concentrating. They have a hard time paying attention. Um, they do less well on tasks that require attention. They are losing things. They're forgetting things. They leave their jacket at school. They forget to bring their books home to do homework. Um, they just have a hard time concentrating and paying attention. That's not to say they can't concentrate at all. They can concentrate, particularly if they're doing something they really like. Um, parents will say, my child can't um, have ADHD. He can play video games for hours. Um, and so we do see that there are pockets of um, things that the child can pay attention to, but overall it's this pattern of inattention and kind of um, losing focus throughout the day.
So that's one set of symptoms. And then we also have the hyperactivity impulsivity that kind of groups together as one set of symptoms. Hyperactivity being excessive movement. These children move around a lot. They have a hard time sitting still. Their parents will describe them as if they have a motor that they can't turn off. Um, and particularly you see this in situations that demand sitting still. So in classrooms, right, they're the ones who are fidgeting, getting up, walking around, need to go to the bathroom all the time. Um, and that's exactly when we, we typically start to see um, and start to diagnose ADHD is when children go to school because that's when there are, there are demands placed on them that they need to stay seated and stay still and you can start to see children who have difficulty with that. Um, and then impulsivity is acting without thinking, um, not thinking about the consequences, not planning. Um, the ch ball runs out into the street and the child runs after it. They're in a tree and they think, oh, I'd like to get down and they just jump without thinking, wow, that could be um, dangerous. Um, we're not going to talk about the stop signal task, but just acting without thinking. Now, what you can, I'm going to, sorry, go back here. What you might notice is that these symptoms are also just symptoms of being a child, right? Children don't pay attention very well all the time. They do forget things. They do lose things. They do move around a lot. They do act without thinking. This is very much just being a child. And so how do you have a diagnosis of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder um, and have that different from just being a normal um, child? So for the diagnosis, the symptoms need to be um, persistent, meaning they have to last for at least six months. So everybody has a day where they're um, inattentive and you can't pay attention and you're just kind of like losing everything. We've all probably had a day like that. That's not enough for a diagnosis. You have to see this these symptoms consistently for at least six months. We do call this a developmental disorder, so the onset has to be before age 12. You have to start seeing these symptoms. And the symptoms have to be present in two or more settings. We call that pervasive, meaning it can't only be at school. If it's only at school that you see these symptoms, then we think, okay, this is an issue with school, that there's a not a great fit between the school and the child or the teacher and the child. If it's only happening at school and the child is perfectly um, fine at home with friends, at uh, grandma and grandpa's house, at sporting activities, then we don't say that it's a problem uh, an ADHD issue, um, you would need to see these symptoms in at least two settings, so at home and at school, at home, at school, with friends, etc. And so that's the way we try to say that we're going ab above and beyond um, typical childhood, and then you also need a, a psychologist or a neuropsychologist who knows a lot about development to be able to distinguish between what is normal to be expected of children at that age and what is beyond, what is more extreme. Associated characteristics with um, ADHD, children often have social difficulties. Um, you know, you can imagine if this is a child who um, isn't able to pay attention, is losing things, is, you know, not follow, is um, getting up out of their chair, interrupting. Um, they can have trouble making friends, keeping friends, right? If this is not just something in class, imagine in a social setting, a child who's constantly interrupting or leaving the group and coming back to the group and not paying attention to what the group is saying, this can make lead to social difficulties as well. Um, it's, it's difficult in school. Teachers often view children with ADHD um, in a more negative way, um, and so we need to try to um, help teachers, and there's a lot more um, available now to help teachers learn how to deal with these kinds of behavioral difficulties. 
Um, it also takes a toll on the family, right? If you have a child who is um, acting this way at home, not thinking, um, not do acting or acting before they think, losing everything, um, not paying attention to what mom or dad are saying, not doing well at school, having trouble with friends. It can take a real big toll on the family. It can lead to um, a lot of family malfunction, parenting stress. Um, and also we see injuries and accidents, particularly because of the impulsive behavior, right? Children breaking their arms because they're jumping out of trees, children um, just getting hurt because they're doing things without thinking of the consequences. Um, we see ADHD in about 3 to 7% of school-aged children. We do see this more in boys than in girls, but can be seen in both. In terms of brain structure and activity, where do we see um, subtle differences is in the frontal lobe, right? So those were those executive functions. A lot of the things that we we're talking about fall under that category of executive functioning. And so we see subtle frontal abnormalities in terms of the frontal lobe being a little bit smaller um, than typical children at the same age, and we see decreased blood flow to the frontal lobes. So the frontal lobes aren't working as hard. And again, those frontal lobes are important for planning, for um, listening to feedback, all of those things for attention that seem to be difficult for children um, diagnosed with ADHD. There are some genetic factors involved in that twin studies suggest heritability that monozygotic or identical twins um, have a higher concordance rate than siblings and then those who share less genes in common. Um, so the more genes in common someone shares with a person diagnosed with ADHD, the higher their likelihood they also will have the diagnosis. There also is a small association with pregnancy and birth complications. So children who are premature are a bit of a higher risk um, and children who are born with a low birth weight, um, again, associated with some of some attentional problems. Um, people have talked about diet. Um, that sugar is an, it potentially an issue or food allergies. Um, you can see here's a book cover, the ADHD diet. Um, there is something to be said for that. And the more we're learning about food allergies, that might be um, some of the, maybe be behind some of the behavioral issues we see. Um, and then psychosocial, of course, parenting um, and what's going on in the child's life makes a difference in their behavior. So um, if you've got issues at home, um, very inconsistent parenting, then children can sometimes have a very difficult time just learning the appropriate ways to behave. And what it appears to be based on our current research is that children have a biological predisposition to ADHD that interacts with psychosocial variables or stressors that lead to the eventual um, outcome of an ADHD diagnosis. So it's again that combination of potentially being born with a biological predisposition, some kind of genes or the way that the brain is um, functioning, and then an interaction with things going on in that child's life. Um, in terms of treatment of ADHD, there is medication, so psychopharmacology. Typically, uh, the medication is a stimulant, um, which is very interesting because you think if somebody is having attention problems and they're um, hyperactive, why would you give them a stimulant? And we call this a paradoxical effect. And the issue is that, remember, we were saying that the frontal lobe, part of your brain that is keeping you paying attention and focused, there's less blood flow to that part of the brain. It's not working as hard. So actually a stimulant will stimulate the blood flow and the activity in the frontal lobe, which then causes the person to calm down and to be able to pay attention and focus. So it's kind of a backwards um, or paradoxical logic, but the stimulants will stimulate the frontal lobe, which then in turn 
helps the person pay attention. And that's what we mean by a paradoxical effect. Um, there are pretty rapid effects of these medications, um, and that's really pretty interesting because we don't have that for a lot of our uh, treatments, medical medication treatments for psychiatric disorders, but for um, ADHD, these medications work right away. And so um, I've worked with a lot of uh, parents and families with ADHD, uh, with children who are diagnosed with ADHD, and if you can imagine years and years of things being very difficult for that child, the child having trouble at school, um, getting in trouble, getting poor grades, the stress at home, um, parents are fighting, the child doesn't have friends, very difficult. And then they finally come to a psychologist and get a, um, get a diagnosis and start this medication. And the next day, everything changes. And parents feel like it's a miracle. They can't believe it. Um, so the effects are rapid, but they wear off quickly. So um, sometimes um, and there are now uh, more longer acting medications as well. That's what, something they have worked on. Of course, there are concerns about medication, particularly when we're talking about children in terms of side effects and if this leads to potentially abuse of not only their prescription drugs, but other drugs. Does it put children at, at risk for that? And over prescription, that there are children who probably don't actually have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, but they are um, given the diagnosis and given the medications, even though they um, potentially don't have the disorder. So the idea of overdiagnosis and overprescription. Um, there are also behavioral interventions, so we can help behaviorally with behavior modification by reinforcing positive behaviors and negative consequences for um, less optimal behaviors. Um, also parent training, teaching parents how to um, do this using behavioral modification. How do you reward positive behaviors to try to increase those um, behaviors using um, different types of charts and things. If a child is really inattentive, then maybe we need a chart or um, something on a cell phone, like a checklist of this is what you need to do before you leave the house to go to school, and they check that off. Um, and then this is what you need to do before you leave school to come home. Be sure you have your book, your jacket, etc. So teaching all of that. Um, also working with the teacher for classroom management, how to um, help follow these skills and what we're teaching the child into the classroom. Um, and then combined medication and behavioral intervention is typically the most effective um, with the goal of eventually um, having behavioral intervention be what teaches the child uh, how to be successful in terms of controlling the symptoms and potentially weaning off the medication at some point. All right, moving on to another part of the frontal lobe called the orbital frontal cortex and the orbital frontal syndrome. This is, and we talked about this in class, Phineas Gage, um, that reliable foreman who had damage to his orbital frontal cortex. And aspects of his personality um, changed. Uh, he became not very reliable. He became not so um, kind and all of the things he used to be. His personality changed. And so we see aspects of personality controlled by the orbital frontal cortex. And when you have damage to that area, we see behavioral disinhibition, um, lack of social judgment, uh, people being tactless, socially inappropriate, However, their basic language, memory, and cognitive skills are intact, and that was kind of the shocking thing with um, Phineas Gage, that he was still alive, he was still able to talk, he was still able to do things, it was just a change in personality. And the person's insight is pretty limited. They don't see that their personality has changed or that they're being inappropriate. Um, the medial prefrontal syndrome, uh, medial prefrontal cortex right here, the major feature of damage to this area is apathy. Um, people are less motivated. 
they have reduced goal-directed behavior, they are very kind of flat in their emotions, meaning they don't really show many emotions, their facial expressions are fairly unchanged, they're not very curious, they don't have any initiative to do anything, um, they don't put forth very e much effort, so it's very much an apathetic kind of presentation. We'll talk about the frontal eye fields. That's an area in the frontal lobe um, that has to do with your voluntary eye movements when you're looking at a very complex visual scene. Um, I'm just checking if I have a... So when you're looking at something um, and you're searching for something in a visual scene, um, your eyes need to kind of have a plan you need to plan where you're looking and what you're looking for um, and so even in something like this complex visual scene if i were to say find the man with the uh, pink shirt if we were tracking your eye movements we should see a sort of plan looking for where the people are and looking in that direction um, versus if i change the instructions and say something about look at the signs on the building and the one that says uh, books your eyes would probably need a different plan because now you're not looking at for people you're looking for words and what we see is that people with damage to the frontal eye fields don't change the pattern of their eyes no matter what the question is they're kind of going about it in the same way and of course the real life is even more complex than that cartoon drawing and so as you're looking for things um, in the world you're walking down the street you're whatever it is looking for a friend on the street or looking for a sign to go into a store um, it can be, be very difficult for people with frontal eye field damage i did want to talk in terms of developmental disorders just a little about autism um, not that it necessarily goes with the, the idea of the frontal lobe but just to add this into our discussion in our class um, so autism has a uh, diagnosis under a category of what's called pervasive developmental disorders, which are early occurring severe impairments. Um, and the diagnosis of autism includes um, children who have problems with social interactions, problems with communication, and restricted repetitive behaviors. Um, and we will talk about all of those things. So in terms of social interaction it, difficulties, this begins in infancy. Um, children are less likely to respond to their names. They're less likely to want to be touched. They avoid eye contact, even as infants. So they will not have had the diagnosis yet. Um, usually children with autism are diagnosed around age three years old. That's when you start to see um, these symptoms, but then looking back, parents can say, yep, that's right. Every time I tried to pick my baby up, they didn't really want to be picked up. They kind of pushed away um, or never really looked in my eyes. And if you've been around um, infants, you would know that that's very unusual. Um, children usually really love um, being picked up and touched and cuddled, and you just see don't see that in children with autism. Um, that doesn't mean they don't show attachment to anyone. They may show attachment to their caregiver, their primary caregiver. Um, and childhood social deficits, they lack understanding of social cues. They ignore other people. They fail to play with others. They really are very much in their own world. Um, and um, autism has a spectrum from very mild to very severe, just like all of the psychological um, and psychiatric disorders. So by the time these children these children become adult adults, and if they're higher functioning um, and kind of out in the world, they may just seem odd um, and have trouble trouble forming friendships because they're really kind of focused on themselves um, and don't really understand social cues and um, kind of how to interact with others. It's this social interaction deficit that we see as a key feature in autism. Also disturbed communication. So this can be verbal and nonverbal. Um, many children with autism 
don't speak at all, and I have that here, about 50% of autistic children are essentially mute and don't learn language. Um, but if they do, their uh, comprehension and expression of language is impaired very often. Um, verbally, um, their verbalizations may be abnormal in their pitch, their tone, and their rhythm. They don't sound like typical um, uh, it doesn't sound like typical language. They may just say a word or scream a word or say a word in a very high-pitched voice. Um, and then nonverbal uh, communication is um, abnormal very often as well. They don't use nonverbal signals, facial expressions, hand movements, things like that that we use as we are trying to communicate. Um, one particular abnormal uh, type of language that we see in autism is what's called echolalia. And this is just echoing back what another person has said. So in some instances, uh, children will be able to um, speak, but their speech is kind of meaningless. They'll say something, but it's just echoing back what someone has said to them. So if they, someone says, hi, how are you? Then they'll say, hi, how are you? Um, and it may be right after they've heard the person say it, or it may be later on in the day. So sometime later on in the day, the child will say, hi, how are you? Which isn't really coming from them as a question about how people are, um, but just that they're repeating back a little snippet of language that they had heard. And then we also see stereotyped movements. These are restricted, repetitive, stereotyped behaviors and things that children will do um, on and on, not for any reason. Um, so rocking back and forth, rocking their body back and forth. Um, they might flap their hands around. They might rub their hands along surfaces or rub their hands together. Um, they might bang their heads against something like a wall. Um, they might spin in circles, walk on their toes, different repetitive movements that they do over and over and over again. Um, and there doesn't appear to be a reason for doing it. Um, they also seem to have obsessed, um, an obsession with activities as well. So um, obsession with things in the environment. They may um, take a car, and this kind of goes along with play. Instead of playing with a toy car in an imaginative way, they'll just take the car and roll it forward and back, forward and back, forward and back, where they're just kind of, obsessed with kind of routine and doing the same thing again and again, as opposed to a creative, imaginative way to play with that car. Um, they often also are very strict in, in their routines. They like routines. Things have to happen in a certain order every day. And if the routine is um, broken in some way, they can get very upset. Okay, so. Um, Associated characteristics, intellectual performance, about 75% of children diagnosed with autism show intellectual deficiencies in some way. Um, deficits we typically see would be with abstract and conceptual thinking, with language, and with social understanding. Um, strengths appear to be with rote learning and memory. Um, they can do extremely well on tasks of um, memory and rote learning, as well as visuospatial skills. A minority of children diagnosed with autism have what we call splinter skills. Those are abilities beyond their level of general intelligence. And even a fewer, a very few, um, have what we call savant abilities, and these are skills that are remarkably better than normal. So not just a little bit better, but better than anyone, better than um, kind of these amazing skills. Um, and now it's very long ago, there was a movie called Rain Man um, that described, uh, or was a movie about um, a adult diagnosed with autism who was a savant who had a particular amazing ability for math and the public you know watched this movie and then thought oh everybody with autism has a skill like that well that is not the case it is extraordinarily rare but when you see it it is pretty amazing um 
And there are different skills. So there's memorization skills where people can have these amazing memorization abilities, like to memorize an entire telephone book um, or an entire nine volume edition of the Groves Dictionary of Music and Musicians. Amazing memory. Um, lightning calculation, being able to do amazing um, calculations in their heads. Um, calendar calculating, if we said like, what day of the week will it be? May 8th, uh, 2532, and they'll be able to tell you that'll be a Wednesday. Um, amazing musical ability, artistic ability. Um, I, so these are um, things you can see in a um, rare amount of uh, children, but nonetheless, it's pretty interesting and impressive. Um, in terms of the psychological deficits in autism, uh, we see the social cognitive deficit. The idea of theory of mind seems to be um, difficult in children with autism um, in that they don't understand that mental states exist and connect to others to connect to actions and that other people can hold a different belief than they have. Um, and we're not going to go into depth about this. You'll you'll learn more about that in a um, abnormal psychology class. But the idea that you might have one kind of mindset or understanding of the world, and someone else could have a different understanding of the world. We do see these executive dysfunctions, um, planning, organization, using feedback, flexibility of thinking. We see executive dysfunction in autism. Um, and it may be that it's the executive functioning impairments that underlie autism. Um, that's still a question we don't know the answer to. Um, individuals aut with autism have weak central coherence. This is the idea that um, using context to give global meaning, um, typically we use the, the big picture to kind of understand what's happening in our world, in a visual scene, et cetera, but we kind of need the big picture to understand the details. Individuals with autism focus on the details rather than the whole. And it's very difficult if you're just focusing on the details to see the big picture. Um, again, it can be in something as, as simple as just a visual scene, but it could be just in um, your communications and your interactions with other people. Um, and they perform particularly well on tests that require focus on details. We do some tests where um, it's a picture. You've probably seen something like this maybe in a child's magazine a long time ago. Um, and you're, you're shown a picture and the question is what's missing? So maybe um, it's a clock and it's missing the second hand or um, different more complex pictures and it's missing a particular part. Well, children with autism do very well on these tasks because they're very good at focusing on the details. Um, this here, and I'm sorry, it looks like it's cut off your screen a little bit, but in this case, this is called a global local task. We do this in neuropsychology. Here's an H uh, made up of small H's. Here's an H made up of little S's, right? Here's an S, and I'm sorry you don't see the bottom of it, made up of H's, and here's an S made up of S's. And so if you ask children with autism to copy, I'm going to do this one here, this big um, H made of little S's. If you ask them to copy this figure, all they'll do is write a bunch of little S's and not see the big picture that it's an H. So they focus on the details, and same with this one. Um, sorry, I'll do this other one in the middle here where there's this, um, the difference. So this is a big S made up of little H's. When you ask them to copy this picture, you just get a whole bunch of little H's. They don't see that it's actually, there's this whole picture of an S. Um, in terms of structural brain abnormalities, this is an interesting one because particularly with severe cases of autism, and again, there are mild cases in children that do really just fine and you just see very mild abnormalities, but you can also see very severe um, cases of autism. And you would expect because it, it the, the behavior is so different and so... Um, uh, in, in some cases, the child is so impaired that you would 
think you would see big changes in brain structure, but you don't. The brain looks very similar to um, a typically developing brain. Um, the gross anatomy is normal. It's only when you do very detailed calculations, when researchers are looking at MRI scans, um, when we say they study voxels, they study little teeny tiny bits of the brain and they're calculating bit by bit, um, where we start to see differences, particularly in the cerebellum, that would be the key area, temporal lobe, and limbic system. Also, in terms of brain functioning, we see that blood serotonin levels are high. Um, what causes autism? Big question. Um, it started out with the idea of failed parenting, that it's parents who were preoccupied or treated each other in a, or treated their children in a cold way. That's why their children had autism. Boy, um, not very nice, that's for sure, and was not at all supported by research. Um, in terms of pregnancy and birth complications, we do see a minor association there. There was a big um, question, there was a big research study that supposedly showed that vaccines um, led to autism. This was also not supported by research. In fact, this article uh, that was initially written, written and that was um, publicized everywhere and had people afraid to vaccinate their children was actually proven to be um, fabricated. The data was fabricated. The um, journal that published the article actually removed the um, article. And this has not been supported by any number of very large research studies that have been done um, since that study. However, um, the idea of this correlation between vaccines and autism is still um, kind of lingers in society and some parents are still afraid to vaccinate their children. However, um, not supported by research. There does seem to be a genetic influence and a higher concordance um, of autism in monozygotic or identical twins than in dizygotic or um, fraternal twins. So the more genes in common somebody shares with a person diagnosed with autism, the higher their risk. Not 100%, but genetics may play a role. Um, the developmental course of autism, it's usually diagnosed during the preschool years. Like I said, by around three or four, you're able to see that um, this child is, is developing in a different way. Um, during childhood, you might see some improvements in terms of their language skills, their cognitive skills, but typically slow development. Um, adolescence is pretty uneventful. Um, you may start to see some behavior problems. Um, and even if it's just because of a social communication uh, deficit, um, as children get older, they can kind of act out, they're bigger, they're stronger, so something that's a temper tantrum in a two-year-old can be um, more serious when it's a temper tantrum in a 13-year-old. Um, most of, most children, um, as they grow up uh, with autism, are not able um, to live independently. They may live in a group home or with their parents, um, although there are some who are able to. All right, that's it. Thank you very much.